Hello, welcome, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Sensational She Geek Live from Yancey Street. Today is Friday, February 19th, 2021, and as it is a Friday episode, I will be talking about the comic books that came out this past Wednesday. Well, Tuesday and Wednesday, DC Comics came out Tuesday the 16th, and the rest of them came out Wednesday the 17th, so I'll be going over a good number of those comic books, which is the main bulk of the episode. After that, we'll go into some news and culture things that are kind of been announced and uh, discussed on the internet and in the industry in the past week or so. And as that, we have some general Zack Snyder thoughts (laughs) as he's been in the news with his uh, Snyder cut of the Justice League movie coming out next month. And we have some thoughts on the Cruella trailer starring Emma Stone that premiered. There's a few other trailers and images and things that were announced. Some cool news from the MCU, uh, including stuff from Multiverse of Madness, theories about what's going to be going on in that, as well as some theories of what we can hopefully see going forward. And then finally, yesterday we had the announcement of the Todd McFarlane Spawn universe, which I was initially extremely, extremely nervous about. Uh, knowing Todd McFarlane, but I've done some reading on it and now I'm actually really excited for it, so I hope that I can get you pretty excited for it too. So let's go ahead and get started this week. Actually, before we get started, I hope that it is okay if I... um, I was thinking of doing some kind of special introductory episode for myself, introducing myself and my history, uh, why you should take what I say about comics possibly seriously. I know what I'm talking about sometimes. I swear I'm not just pulling this out of my butt. Um, or just stealing it off the internet. Uh, I do have some actual good thoughts on things, and I do have a history of reading these things for a long time and getting to know these characters and the way that comics kind of work. So I was thinking if possibly people are interested in an episode like that, getting to know who the sensational she-geek is, that would be me. If that is something that is at all interesting to you, or if you have any questions that you would like me to answer for uh, some kind of episode like that, go ahead and let me know on whatever format you are listening to this podcast on and hopefully I can get that out in the next couple of weeks because I've been thinking about it a good bit. I feel like that would be kind of a fun thing to add to make this more of a legitimate, you know, the ethos pesos lo- ethos pesos logos thing. You got to get the why you should listen to me as well as the making it a good podcast if that makes sense. But if anybody's interested in that, let me know. Otherwise, let's go ahead and get started with comic books that came out this past week. Like I said, DC Comics came out on Tuesday the 16th, and on Wednesday the 17th was the rest of the comic books. It's traditionally Wednesdays, but DC is DC, and they wanted to make themselves special like that. So let's go ahead and get started with this week's comic picks. My top comic pick this week, unsurprisingly if you know me, was of course Batman Catwoman number 3. This series continues to be an absolute work of art. This is, of course, by Tom King, Clay Mann, and colors by Tamu Mori, I believe is how you say that. Um, I did a long, I don't know, it was a fairly long breakdown of Tom King's layout of the Bruce Wayne, Selina Kyle, Batman, Catwoman romance, as he's kind of done it starting in 2016 with his Batman run. I go through that whole relationship on my previous podcast, episode 5A, that came out on Monday. So if you're at all curious or lost in this series or interested in knowing about it, go ahead and check that out. The main meat of it that you need to know pretty much is the three time periods that these this one series is being told through are all connected to different writings of Tom King, putting together pieces of their relationship through... He did the 85 issues of Batman, he did Batman Annual Number 2, and he's done, it was Detective Comics 1027, he filled in some pieces of it there as well. So it's a couple of different pieces of of comic book history, kind of, that you pick through to get these stories and put them together, but as soon as you figure out the story layout that he works with in the series, it becomes very fluid and it's like watching an episode of a TV show. So... Uh, go back and listen to episode 5A if you're cur- more curious and want to hear some more in-depth ep- explanation about that. But meanwhile, uh, the three periods that we see in this series is, of course, the flashback period where Selena Kyle and Bruce Wayne, Batman and Catwoman, are fresh in their relationship. She's still a villain and he's 
still the hero trying to get her to stop being the villain. The second time period we see is the modern, I suppose, time period where you get Bruce and Selina in a relationship that they are a solid pair. They're pretty much heroing together. Uh, and that is when, let's see, Andrea Beaumont returns and she was the Phantasm in Mask of the Phantasm. So he even pulls from Phantasm in this. That's pretty cool too. Makes it canon. And then the final period, of course, is the future, which takes place after Bruce Wayne has passed away, and Selina Kyle has gone off to do her dastardly things, and their daughter is an adult working as Batwoman, across from, we'll see in this in this issue, Commissioner, I was going to say Commissioner Gordon, it's not Commissioner Gordon, it's Commissioner Dick Grayson. So taking a look at those three time periods and what happened in them in this issue, we'll start with the flashback period. What's been happening there is Selina has been kind of working with the Joker um, as a villain with him and hiding it from from Bruce. But she's also been hiding all of Bruce's secrets, all I should say all of Batman's secrets, from the Joker because of course the Joker wants to know all of these things that now Selina is privy to, but she's not going to tell him. So what's happened now is Selina is pissed off that Joker has just gone too far on one of his little schemes. He made a family, it sounded like, into reindeer. So you can just imagine the carnage there. Um, and what was really cool is she asks him at one point, what's wrong with you? And he just says, I don't know. And that's awesome because that really is, that is the Joker. He is crazy and he doesn't even know what's wrong with him. And no, but that's why the whole Harley Quinn thing happened. Nobody can fix this man because he's not fixable because he's not really anything definably wrong with him. He's just the Joker. And that's just the way he is. Um, so they go through some of that. And then towards the end of this current timeline or that, excuse me, the flashback timeline, um, it was kind of an odd thing. It was at the very end of the issue and it's, you see Selena opens up a safe and it's from behind her and you can't see what's in the safe. And she just starts talking to the Joker and he hands her, I don't remember honestly what it was. He hands her this thing, whatever it was for her to hold on to. And she says, okay, cool. And then you, the final page, you see it. He got himself into the safe. I, I assume he must have got himself into the safe because he knew that she was going to be showing up here to rob the place. And to to give this message to her of here's this thing. And he's he's like contorted himself it is the creepiest thing. Clay Man did an excellent job of making it look like this bizarre, almost Picasso looking thing of the Joker shoved himself into this like putting your body into a suitcase. It is the it was the creepiest kind of unsettling thing. Um so there's still some stuff going on. Obviously, she's still going to be working with him no matter her anger with him and no matter Bruce is questions of, you know, he's seeing the bruises. He's questioning who, how the Joker is still getting away with things. It's because of her. He's not going to ask it. Well, he did ask it straight up and she lied in the last issue. So that's clearly going to cause problems. I have highly doubt that she ever came clean with this shit because now in the future, excuse me, in the current timeline, I guess modern timeline, Phantasm, who it's Andrea Beaumont, her son was killed by the means of the Joker. She's going around killing everybody who's worked with the Joker as punishment for him. And the Joker, of course, being the um, foul world, <laughs> foul world that he is, he turned himself into Batman and Catwoman to have them keep him safe from her while they try and figure out who she's going to attack next. And of course, she's still killing people. While they're looking for her, they can't seem to keep up with her list, whatever this list is that she has of how she knows these people at one point in their lives worked with the Joker. She's killing them. And that becomes a problem because, as you remember from this flashback timeline, Selena was working with the Joker. So Bruce is out one night in this modern timeline and the Phantasm shows up to their house, the, the Wayne Manor and attacks Selina to kill her. Because you have to imagine Phantasm has this list of people they didn't ever know worked with the Joker, but she does. So she's going to know about Catwoman having worked with the Joker. So she wants to kill Catwoman as well. She just sees it all as black and white. That's kind of the whole thing with the Phantasm. So she tries to, she, she attacks Selina. The two of them end up falling out the window. I believe it was the second story of the building and onto the ground, unconscious on the ground. And what's interesting during this whole scuffle, this whole kerfuffle, Bruce is actually on comms with Selina. She's not, it's like he's, I think he's leaving her a message is actually what it is. 
Um, and he's saying, hey, Selena, sorry to wake you up, but the alarm went off at the house. If you could just check it, it's probably nothing. The system, you know, needs to get checked every now and then. And then when I come home later on, I'll double check it and you can just go back to sleep after you check this out and it'll be fine. And then, of course, by the end of that, he says, you know, the I'll be ch- I'll check it when I come home and you can get back to bed. They're falling through the window, um, crashing down to being unconscious on the ground. So I guess I'm guessing, of course, Bruce is going to have to come home and find them like that. Or Phantasm is going to scuffle off wounded. I'm not really sure, but it's going to cause some problems. This is going to come out now that Selena has lied to him for years, probably. And that'll just be another test of their relationship. But clearly they get through it because we have the future timeline still to check in with where they do have a daughter together. And that's Helena, the Batwoman. Clay man, I have so much gratitude for you being such a phenomenal artist on this series. I can't say enough how fantastic your art is. And I know Tom King is always tweeting about the bricks. The bricks. No, that's, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm serious. The bricks. He hand drew all the bricks on this one page. And it's... I can't even imagine the excruciating patience and time that it took to get all of that done. I am... I am each issue that this continues to go through, I am more and more impressed. Somehow it continues to surpass the previous level of being impressed. This issue we have, of course, we knew it was coming, was Helena's bat, bat woman suit, which, of course, I have been shouting it everywhere that I can across social media. What a fucking, excuse me, phenomenal design. I try not to cuss on this show. I get so excited sometimes. That's what a great design for the daughter of Batman and Catwoman. She has the cowl the old school ears part of the cowl from the original Batman suit. She has kind of more of the face of the Catwoman suit. She has the upper body that's kind of a toned, um, not toned, armored look to the Batman kind of style of the suit. But then the lower half of it is a sleek, more of a um, whatever kind of leggings or something material that she can do a lot more uh, slick movable fighting moves like her mother. So it's a perfect combination of the two suits and I absolutely love it. At one point in the issue, we get to see her sitting across the table from her aged mother and her face, again, Clay Man, wow. Her face is somehow a perfect combination of his Bruce Wayne and Selena Kyle faces. She has more or less Selena's face, but she has a little bit of the broader chin and features of Bruce. So looking at it, it's it's really like he did the whole thing of designing a person through the... It, I don't know how he did it. It's just phenomenal. Helena is gorgeous, obviously, but she looks so much like both of her parents. I am so utterly impressed with Clay Man's designs for her in every way. So we see her uh, talk to Commissioner Dick Grayson, which is really, really cool um, and brings up a lot of questions for me about where are the other Bat family members. My husband and I were talking about it and our theory is that possibly he and Barbara are still together since it seems that that's what DC is kind of pushing um, in their main canon universe, I guess, even though they just put out a, a Valentine's Day Starfire Nightwing story, but whatever. They seem to be pushing that. So possibly there's, she's still oracling it up. Maybe she's the mayor of Gotham. Maybe she's teaching at a university. Um, But I think she's probably still around. I don't think she would leave Gotham unless she had passed away, which is also, you know, a possibility. People are going to die in in time, whether you like it or not. Um, I also wonder where Damien is because, you know, Damien is her half brother. Um... I think the most obvious answer to where Damien is, though, is he's probably doing uh, Son of the the Demon stuff, or I guess he's probably head of the Demon now, right? Because he's the grandson of Ra's al Ghul, uh, Talia being his mother, so he's heir to that whole thing. Uh, And then again, my husband and I were talking and theorizing, it'd be cool if he and Orphan got together, um, Cassandra, Kane. that would be kind of cool. They have a similar parentage story kind of sort of (laughs) both sort of uh, heirs to strange fighting empires but anyway i'm getting way too off track here so you get you get helena on the roof with dick grayson who is the commissioner of gotham and he's telling her how they found a body in florida because of course in the last issue selena finally tracked down the joker and killed him for what he did to andrea which again is something we have not yet seen. We've seen the death of his son, not quite at the hands, but due to the Joker. 
Um, and that's why she's going around killing all of his people in the modern timeline. But in this future timeline, Selena has it out for him to a point that I think there's something else that is going to happen here where the Joker is going to do something else to Andrea that's going to cause Selena to have this lifelong desire to hunt him down and kill him no matter what literally everybody else in her life, including her husband on his deathbed, pleads and begs and gets her to promise not to do. And of course, so she did that. And now we have Helena talking to Dick about the body and she's saying she doesn't think that it's him because they searched Florida and he wasn't there. And Dick is saying it's probably him because there was the white skin under some regular makeup and who else would that be? So she goes and she talks to her mother about it at dinner, which was a very cool scene. Their dynamic, I'm not quite sure about yet. Because Helena is definitely trying to pry some things out of her mother to see if her mother has any answers or if her mother is hiding anything. And, Sel and Selena knows that she's doing that. So she's staying as far away from that whole topic as she can. Um, I can't really say for sure yet if they are friendly. I imagine they're having dinner together, so they must be. But that could also just be, you know, them doing it because they're meant to. Um, but I'm really interested what's going to happen. They do confirm, Helena gets it confirmed through Dick, through the Florida Police Department, that it is the Joker. They do the DNA testing. Um, so H Helena is convinced, and of course she's correct, that it has to do, his death has to do with the recent death of her own father, Batman. And so I'm really curious. That's it. I don't know if it's going to be shit hitting the fan or if it's going to be massive disappointment in her mother or what, but it's going to be something's going to happen and she's going to figure it out probably sooner than later. And I'm, I'm really curious how she's going to handle, how they're going to handle the situation, the two ladies, the remaining two ladies of the Bat family that we've seen so far. Um, overall... Once again, this is a phenomenal issue. Batman Catwoman, I can't recommend enough. Once again, I know I've said this like five times. I did on my last podcast episode. I did talk about the relationship that Tom King has set up for them. So you can go check that out, episode 5A. But I think I've talked about this enough. It's time to move on to other comics. One of my second favorites this week, I was severely impressed as I was with the first issue, was Superman Worlds of War, excuse me, as Future State, Superman Worlds of War number two. It's a long, long title there, but you get it. This is easily the best Superman story that came out of Future State, and it's going to be continued. It's actually a four-part story by Philip Kennedy Johnson that is going to be continued in Superman House of L, which is another two-parter. So this is, oh my god, this is the Superman story that I have always wanted. Um, you got in the last issue, you got all these people telling the stories of how Superman saved them, what he meant to them, what they think he's doing, because he's missing now, right? He's he's on Mongol's war world, uh, as we discover in this issue, being killed by Mongol over and over and over again. Apparently it's happened thousands of times he's been killed by Mongol. Oh my, it's brutal. <laughs> it's so brutal. And I love it. It's so cool. Mongol wants to basically do this to the point where he has brainwashed Superman into being his minion, and then he'll send him back to Earth and have him slaughter all his own people. Or, I guess, you know, people he was meant to protect on Earth. Holy shit, that's brutal, and I love it. So, in this issue, we get the follow-up of the girl who we saw in the first issue, uh, who said that Clark Kent saved her, and she storms off at the end because she doesn't think anybody at this little meeting here in Smallville understands the true Superman, the true Kal-El, the true Clark Kent, because they are the same person. So she had stormed off, and this issue picks up with someone following after her, wanting to get her story, what she meant about Clark Kent having saved her. And it's very, very cool what they do. She pulls out a newspaper article, written by Clark Kent several times, I guess several years ago, I assume, about a homeless man who had recently passed away. Clark Kent, I guess, came to know this man and his impressive history and the story of what his this one man's life's value, even though he appeared to be completely nothing noteworthy on the street, uh, his, his, his knowledge of the value and his taking this man's value being... His life was meant so much to Clark and he was so nothing to so many people. And I guess it was, it was that notion of every life mattering, no matter what it might seem right now, that saved her life. So 
the story is basically the man he was he was a kind of a pacifist but he ends up joining the army and going and fighting in world war ii because he wanted to fight the nazis because he felt that that was you know his duty um and the thing that he does a lot of stuff in his life but the thing that stuck with me was um the people around him eventually fall away or pass away uh leave him whatever it may be but he after his son died he started a scholarship in his son's name and even when he became homeless, he made sure to make to show up to wherever he had to go, whatever centers he had to use, the free services, the free computers, to get in contact with people to make sure that scholarship would continue even though he had no money to feed himself half the time. And that was probably the one thing that you need to know to understand why Clark Kent admired this man so much. Um, and of course, at the backdrop of all of this, this, this article being read is Superman fighting for the freedom of Mongol slaves on War World, which is futile as anything, and they all end up dying to his absolute horror, and Mongol shows up and gives him this speech about you're hopeless or whatever and kills him, and then he revives him in the basement or wherever his lab is, and gives him his mighty plan of we're basically going to brainwash you and send you back to Earth to kill you, you worthless scum, I'm, I'm finally going to beat you, you know, the, this is the usual stuff. Um, but this is going to continue, and it ends kind of there, um, with Superman still in chains, which I want to, wa- I'm so curious why they went with this outfit design for Superman. I'm not against it, don't get me wrong, but it's just, he's got a giant metal thing on his chest that's the, just the, the symbol of the House of L, the big S, you know? And then he has, it's wrapped, it's attached to him in chains, and then he has his shorts on, but not the leggings. I want to know why they chose this outfit design. It's very interesting. It's equality in comics, if you want to go there (laughs) with outfit designs. But I, I, I really enjoy Philip Kennedy Johnson. I am supremely impressed with what you've been writing for Superman. There were, of course, three other stories in that issue. They were fine but this was the best one. And in Superman House of L, we're going to be seeing some really cool stuff. I will be talking more about that, I believe, on the Monday episode, episode 6A, because that was when I'm going to be going over comics coming out next Wednesday. So make sure you show up for that if you want to hear about things that I will be reading and am excited for. The third comic that I picked out to talk about this week in my comic book picks was Black Widow number 5 by... Kelly Thompson and Elena Casagrande with Jordi Belair on art. We did have a guest artist this month as well for two pages. Um, This was really good. I did mention in my last podcast episode that this was going to be a make it or break it issue for this series for me. And it definitely made it. It went far and above what I was predicting was going to happen and blew my expectations out of the water. Kind of went in the direction that I didn't even kind of see happening and it was a little bit of like you the whole thing about her family is are they dead or aren't they um they're not and that was i'm really really glad they're not because that that's not just natasha being a victim that's being these two innocent people being a victim now too and that's just like a lot of being victims for like just uh, torturing natasha some more um so I'm glad that, that they did say that it was they did a hol- they did the hologram thing. It wasn't them. It was holograms. Which is like, all right, that's that's the comics thing. They always got something up their sleeve, <laughs> but that's fine. It it works, I guess, well enough. Um, what I really wanted to to say is uh, the relationships that Thompson writes. She does it in Captain Marvel really well too, as well. But she started it here uh, immediately. It was very very clear that she writes the. Natasha and her, or Natalia as Yelena calls her, she writes these relationships really well, be it between uh, Bucky, Clint, Yelena, Nat, or Red Guardian, her ex-husband. I don't know if you know that, but Red Guardian is her ex-husband. Um, the relationships are very, very spot on, in my opinion. Uh, most interestingly, I think, is how Clint is very much the lovesick puppy dog I think he's had a hard on slash just been completely enamored with Natasha probably since the day he met her relationships that he's in otherwise be damned. He cheated on Mockingbird with Natasha. He, he uh, has cheated on, I think every woman he's been with or screwed them over in some way. (laughs) Good on you, Clint. 
Uh, but he is he is a lovesick puppy dog in her sight, and she trusts Bucky more than anybody else in this issue, which we see because he she sends him off to save the family. But what's really cool about that? Well, she sends him off to to put them in a safe place, and she doesn't. She when he comes back. She, don't tell me, Bucky. I don't want to know. It's safer that way. I don't think Thompson is going to bring the, this family back. If they get brought back, it's probably going to be a different writer. I could be totally wrong. We'll see. Uh, but Bucky's not being there actually played two roles. One was, of course, to find the family a safe place away from where anybody would ever look for them. And all we know is it's the Pacific Northwest. I feel like that's pretty appropriate if they were from San Francisco. The other role he played was to confuse the shit out of their enemies as Bucky, Clint, or as Clint, Yelena, and Nat are all doing the escape thing against the group of people led by, what was it? It was Viper, I think. Uh, the Red Guardian was one of them as well, except he tells Nat in Russian that I was doing it to protect you, which I believe because he's her ex-husband. Um, they are the whole time during this fight with them. They're all looking around. Where's Winter Soldier? We see them. Eyes on them. Eyes on him. Eyes on her. Where's Winter Soldier? And so they're all wondering, is he going to pop out of the shadows at any moment? So it's freaking them out. That's throwing them off their game, not knowing what 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 he's going to do and when he's going to pop out to scare them or kill them. But he wasn't. He was really just saving this family. So he actually had two roles, saving the family and then confusing the shit out of their, their enemies here. And that worked out really well. Uh, the Red Guardian telling Nat that he was only in this kill Nat club to better protect her was, I think, a nice little thing to th put in there because I think that's gonna that's showing we're going to see more of him in the series later on. I really, really like the three Russians that we have here. We have Nat, we have Yelena, and Red Guardian. While we don't see, I don't think Yelena talked to Guardian, uh, the stuff between Nat and the two of them was really, really good uh, pulling out the history of the Black Widow and her relationships. So I'm hoping we see more of that going forward. Um, and of course, as usual in this issue, Elena Casagrande's art is seductive and stunning. We were talking last night about it and it is a combination of Joelle Jones and um, Otto Schmidt. So it's, it's, it's the gorgeous inkiness of Joelle Jones with the sass of Schmidt. <laughs> Um, so it's absolutely stunning artwork. And of course, at the end of this issue, we get the first look at the new look for Black Widow. I believe this is the first time that she's had a hood on her suit. So that's very fun. If I'm wrong, sorry about that. But it does remind me a lot of the original Rogue. When Rogue first appeared, of course, she was a villain. But she had that odd hood over her odd hair. <laughs> um, but it... it looks really good on this Black Widow look. She still has the kind of half-shaved head of hair, it looks like. It's going to take a while to grow back in anyway. So I really am enjoying that. And it looks like it has some kind of glowing seams as well. I'm not sure we'll see we'll see that clarified more in the future. And of course, there's pictures of the suit all over online. They had all of the Casa Grande uh, art design papers. They were kind of floating around the internet to show us the preview. And so I guess it'll be that next issue... We'll have the, pr the proper premiere of her using the suit and possibly Black Widow being a hero for the first time. She wants to make her kind of sort of former husband and child proud, although they'll never meet again, hopefully if things go well. Um, so she actually asked Yelena to, to go along with her and Yelena was even taken back a little bit by that. Um, so this is this is possibly going to be the widow going in a different direction. We'll see how long she can kind of make that work. I know DC was kind of trying to do the same thing with Harley Quinn, and it's not really going over as well for some reasons. But Black Widow is definitely definitely more of a hero type. I feel like she this will be really interesting. I don't know how it's going to go, but it's going to be really interesting. And as I said, this issue was definitely a make it or break it for me, and it definitely made it far and above what I was even expecting. I also want to talk a little bit about the picture of everything else number two. This is just a really, really cool series. If you are familiar at all with the story, the picture of Dorian Gray, it's kind of a follow-up to that. The guy who is the painter in this who can kill people by painting them and destroying them, his name is... Oh gosh, his name is Basil, that's what it is. 
um, it's it's B A S I L, but it's you know no one's name is Basil. It's Basil. Um, so he it seems was I'm a little unfamiliar. It's been a while since I've been, read the or heard the story of Dorian Gray, the picture of Dorian Gray, and the last time I'm pretty sure I last rendition I heard was the movie, which I would not be surprised if had it all wrong. Um, but I'm pretty sure this guy was possibly the person who painted Dorian. And then it says Dorian stabbed him like seven times and left him bleeding in front of one of his paintings. So that's why I think possibly he's one of, he's the one who painted Dorian. I don't really remember how that all goes. Uh, now he's come to Paris to relax, uh, and heal. And that was when the story picked up with Marcel and Alphonse, the artist slash kind of companion lovers from the first issue. And now we have Alphonse has gone off to be a uh, worker, I guess, with Basil to go paint with him. Apprentice with him, I suppose, is the right term. And it's been some time. Now they're into the year 1900 now. It's the turn of the century. Um, and Marcel is no longer a painter. He is a critic because he can't bring himself to paint. It's, I don't know if the writer of this is French or has a lot of time spent in Europe, but this is so European of him. It's, he had this bad experience with art and now he can't bring himself to paint. (laughs) Um, and they do go a little bit into the serious PTSD that he does have from witnessing this man kill so many people and destroy all the bodies by burning the paper. And so when he runs into Alphonse, they have a little talk, and he's kind of horrified that Alphonse is still with the man, working with him. Um, and what Alphonse has to say about that night is that he was testing the limits of his power or something like that. Um, so that doesn't really make me feel... You know, I don't think that's what make Marcel feel better about it all. Um, but Marcel has a new lover, and he unfortunately... His curiosity gets the better of him after Alphonse invites him to come study painting with them him and Basil, and he unfortunately leaves his lover, writes him this very honestly beautiful critique of himself, saying what a wonderful guy he is, um, and leaves him. So hopefully that softened the blow a little bit, but I don't know. (laughs) What's really also, aside from the story being, oh, oh, and that's not even the ending. The ending, I'm going to spoil this for you, but the ending is, um, you see Basil's painting the city of Paris and it's, you kind of thinking, Oh, what's he doing now? You see then the city of Paris and he drops a blot of red ink onto the canvas above the cathedral of Notre Dame and people actually at the cathedral of Notre Dame and Paris look up into the sky in horror as a splot giant splotch of red appears in the sky. So, that's not a good sign for the for the citizens of Paris. Uh, Basil has control of your whole city as long as he can paint it accurate enough. He can do whatever he wants, and that's he basically he kind of just bottled that portion of the city in his painting. Kind of that's very interesting. Um, I'm I'm really curious how that's gonna go. But the coolest thing probably about this series so far it's only two issues in, but the art is completely sublime. It is somehow a mix of minimalistic and highly detailed. It is watercolors with, I guess you would say the highly detailed watercolors with minimalistic inking possibly over it. I'm not really sure how the artist would do that, but it's, it is so beautiful. It is beautiful, colorful pages that capture the light and the spirit of turn of the century Paris, which was a huge era of artist culture a wealth of creativity that was pouring from that area in that time. Um, and they capture it beautifully in the art and the style of the art. And I, uh, it's two issues in, but I think I'm going to keep the series on for a good long while. Keep it going for a good bit. Um, the last couple of things I want to talk about here, uh, two feature state books, the next Batman and Catwoman number two in Catwoman. It's my Bruce and Selena question answered was all I was, all I was in this for, to be completely honest. Basically what it is, is each one of them thought the other was dead, and when they finally see each other, they're shocked. Selena slaps him, and then they embrace and kiss, of course. 
Um, they briefly catch up and they have to split up again at the end, go on separate trains, go in different directions. And at the last moment, Selena asks how they're going to find each other again, because obviously they had a hard time this time. They both thought each other was dead. And he tells her to steal something important. So, oh, that's cute. Throw back to their, you know, relationship being stemmed from her being a thief and him being a hero trying to stop her. So that's cute. And in the next Batman, of course, we had three stories. The Tim Fox story, which was really, really good. John really does such a phenomenal phenomenal job with the way that Tim Fox talks. He is not Bruce Wayne, and that distinction has been made super clear. Also, the dynamic between Tim and his family is super interesting, and we're going to be getting another four-issue Tim Fox series written by John Ridley coming out, I believe, in March, called Next Batman's Second Son, I think is what it's called. And that's going to go over, I assume, how he kind of ends up with this bad relationship in his family and then turns out to be Batman or decides to become Batman still after that. So really, really good story. I recommend reading all four of them. Unfortunately, they do have two issues, excuse me, two small stories with them in each issue. The second one was Vita Yala and the next Batgirl story, which I had a lot of fun with. There's a lot of characters and kind of hints and things and the clues in the background that are really fun to go and look out for. Um, but what I kind of want to talk about more, I love Vita Yala's writing, but something in the third story really caught my attention that I wanted to bring up here. In the Siren story, it's Harley, or excuse me, it's Ivy and Catwoman and this new third Siren who's actually a robot who dies in the end. Um, but they have this, they're talking about relationships and they bring up how Catwoman's have been with Bruce, you know, off and on through decades and... And then they bring up Harley Harley and Ivy being in a relationship. Um, Catwoman calls her Mrs. Quinn, which is not something that has been canon in the main DC universe ever. So I'm a little bit confused. Are they confirming that it's been there the whole time? Are they saying it's going to happen for real sometime between whenever this story is taking place and where we're at right now? Where we're at right now is Harley Quinn is trying to be a hero, supposedly, and she's in Batman, which, honestly, she's written so terribly in Batman, it's it's not funny. I had to stop reading that series because it was written so badly about the, the, all the female characters were just not handled well. But Ivy is going to be popping up in Catwoman and possibly in Swamp Thing, who are written by the same guy, so that makes sense. Um, but the last time we saw Ivy, she basically called her, said, you know, screw humanity, screw Harley Quinn. I'm done being used by you and having you stab me in the back. So she killed all the, you know, the clowns who were sick, scattered around her and decides to call herself Queen Ivy and just goes off. So we're going to be finding her in this Catwoman series, kind of getting off track here. I'm just still curious, is this DC confirming Harley and Ivy are going to be together, that they have been together? Or what? Or is this just an alt reality? Because the only things that have been canon of them being together will have been alternate realities. So, real curious about how that's going to end up being. And of course, I have to mention Immortal Wonder Woman number two, uh, Becky Cloonan and Michael Conrad, and Jen Bartel on the main Immortal Wonder Woman story. I had some critiques of the first issue of this. The second one was definitely far better. I don't, it's funny, they seem to be doing, they seem to do Diana better when there are less people around. Um, apparently some people are mad about how Diana told Clark she loved him, and I guess they just forgot that platonic love is a thing, so there we go. Um, <laughs> it was what I really liked most about her, about this is, this Wonder Woman Diana part of the issue uh, was her interactions with the Phantom Stranger, who was a fellow Silver Age character. Uh, he premiered in 1940 compared to Diana, Diana's appearance in 1941. Uh, they had a nice little chat together, being the last two beings in the universe. And then, kind of, uh, he just kind of dissipates from existence. Because he was just, he says he was just waiting on to see who the other person who was around was, and now that he knows it's her, he's gonna let go, and he lets she helps him let go, and he kind of just disappears. Um, and then the the occurrence, whatever it is that she calls it, the the darkness swarms in on her and overtakes her, and in a final um, final blast of all of her power, she uses this power that she has left inside of her to birth a new universe. I suppose is what happened with her life force. 
Um, so technically, the theory that I had that she was going to sacrifice herself for some hope that there may be, you know, life in the universe again was correct. She sacrificed herself to create a universe from within herself. So there you go. So I assume it's going to be a brand new baby universe creating, you know, plasma and whatever new universe stuff happens. The uh, second story in it, of course, was the Nubia story, which I think was a little bit wordy, but still very interesting. We got to see who her goddess, patron goddess, is. I don't know what you would call her. She calls her the lioness, um, her real name I forgot to write down. But I, as far as I know, she's kind of a newer thing. I'm not going to actually say that because I'm probably wrong. Um, but I'm really excited to see Nubia come to power in Infinite Frontier. It seems that her tiara she wears is definitely connected to her power, and her power is connected to this goddess. So I'm looking forward to see what is the whole thing that's going to happen here. How are we going to get to... Assuming that that's what's going to end up being, is Nubia is going to be the real Wonder Woman for real at one point. How are we going to get to that point, and what's going to happen to get there? Uh, in just br very briefly... We had Cable this week, which was, of course, phenomenal. It's Gary Duggan on a new version of a legacy character for him and Phil Noto, period. So really, really fun, really beautifully written and drawn, and just really interesting. So it's a, Cable is one of the, I think, probably one of my favorite Reign of X books now. It started Dawn of X, and it's continued on to be really good through X of Swords and beyond. Definitely pick that one up if you're trying to figure out what X-Men stuff might be fun to read in 2021. Also, we had Spider-Woman number one, excuse me, number nine. <laughs> um, I love Carla Pacheco's Spider-Woman. She's been drawing her very, excuse me, writing her very dark, but this is probably the darkest that we've seen her. Um, if you ever have, you know, the dreams, if you've ever seen the videos about the people who absolutely lose their crap and like just screaming down the street, you know, people are filming them and they're just yelling at them, throwing, you know, start fighting people, whatever it is. Like, this is basically where Jessica's at. She, there is no logic, there is no reasoning, there is no anything. Uh, she's just in this really dark place of this kind of crazy madness determination. But now she's trapped around a bunch of murdery clones of her mother and their murdery master who just murdered her own daughter, who was a clone of herself, I think. Um, seems to be not the first clone, too. It seems to be just one of a line of clones of her daughter she's made. I could be wrong on that, but that's how I took all of that. Um, so Jessica's in a really dark place, and of course, I believe it is issue 11 that we are going back to her being in her classic red and black suit, which I'm kind of sad about because I really like this kind of stealthy black one. But it is what it is. Um, King in Black, number four, of course, came out this week as well. I'm a little bit frustrated. I only ex in King and Black, ex <laughs> King and Black, in Black Cat number two a few weeks ago, we saw Felicia saving Stephen Strange. They escape, and then they use this magical staff that he was meant to use for him on her, um, and she turns into this big Asgardian something or other. We don't really know yet because that's literally how the issue ended. Now, in King and Black number four this week. We see her stuck in the same group as the rest of the heroes, not on top of the Empire State Building with just Steven the way that it was in Black Cat. And it's Dylan who saves them. And then she hands the staff off to Steven and he uses it to do the same thing that she did at the end of Black Cat, turning into the same Asgardian something or other, it seems. So why are we getting kind of the same story, but in two different series of events? Um playing out two different ways, if you kind of know what I'm saying here. I don't really understand. It's, it's, this is the same event. This is Black Cat is a King and Black tie-in, and King and Black number four is the main series. So you would think that they would have the continuity correct, but it's just not been, and it's very frustrating. Of course, we did find out spoilers, of always at spoilers, in the ending, we kind of ending, we, we, we always knew, we've known that there's going to be a God of Light across from the god of darkness, who is Noel. We've known that. We've known that for a long time. We just haven't known who it is. Donny Cates keeps bringing it up as a thing that's, like, dramatic, and we're just finding out. We've known it. Um, so we find out in this issue, finally, Silver Surfer's trying to get into the bubble um, of the world, and he encounters this the white light, and he thinks that it wants to, to be him, to use him as a host, and he goes, oh okay, you are not here for me, and lets it into the, or helps it get into the bubble of Earth being surrounded by symbiote goop, which is ridiculous, but whatever. 
um, and it goes inside and turns out it is Captain Universe, which on the one hand is kind of like a ba-dump bump bump, you know, but on the other hand, it's kind of cool because we've never really had an explanation for Captain Universe um, and what it is. And of course it goes to the dead body of Eddie Brock. And now Eddie Brock is going to be Captain Universe. He's going to take out Noel and then he's going to be the new God of the Symbiotes or whatever, or possibly Dylan. But this whole thing is like, okay, Donny Cates, we get it. You like your own writing. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I don't really understand the continuity errors that keep coming up in this event. I don't understand why the symbiotes that are null symbiotes on earth look completely different and honestly far superior in the tie-ins, many tie-ins, like different across all the tie-ins than they do in this main book. Um, it's like the editorial didn't get a main idea of what they wanted people to do. They just let people draw what they think it should look like. <laughs> but I don't know, maybe that's how things go and it just usually looks better or I don't know. Um, kind of an odd one, but that's fine. The last one I want to talk about was also a Thor book, Thor number 12. I'm sorry, Donny Cates book. Getting ahead of myself there. Thor number 12. Um, we had finally, we see Throg. Yay! Throg is one of my favorite, oddly enough, superheroes. Briefly to go over his origin, Simon Walterson, which is the play on Walt Simonson who created Thor, was a football player who was cursed by a witch to be a frog because of various reasons. He took, he takes the name Puddlegup, Puddlegulp as a frog. Uh, when Thor becomes a frog because of Loki and other reasons, Puddlegulp helps him out, witnesses Thor become Frog Thor, and witnesses Frog Thor help out the community of frogs who live in New York to save them from some swamp-dwelling predators. I don't remember if it's alligators or crocodiles. After Frog Thor leaves, um, he does... Puddlegulp does find a shard of Mjolnir, and he picks it up and becomes Throg, the Frog of Thunder. So that's his origin story uh, very briefly. This was really cool, although I did have some issues with it towards the end. You get to have um, Throg and Lockjaw fighting this guy, uh, <laughs> and they beat him, and, you know, there's a thing where he eats him and he spits him out because it's Throg. I, th I feel like every person who writes Throg has to have him eaten by something, and then he bursts out of them in some way. Just because I feel like everything I've written with read of Throg ever has had that, um, and it's, he does have a funny moment. He calls he calls his Mjolnir Frogulner or something like that. I don't know how you really make that work, pronunciation wise, but I tried. Um, and then at the end, Jane Foster finds Odin in a bar and says, "All right, Mister, you got to come solve your problems," which we knew was coming. Um, but the problem that I had here was you have. Uh, the, you have this guy, I'm struggling with names today, but you have this guy who's beaten by Throg and Lockjaw, and they take him beaten to Doctor Strange to help, you know, solve him, and all of a sudden, he beats Throg and Lockjaw and Doctor Strange after having just been, had the crap beaten out of him. He was unconscious when they took him there. How did that happen? I get he wants, I get Donny Cates wants this guy to be like this big bad villain, but it just doesn't I get that Odin gave him this power and yada, 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 but it's like, it doesn't quite match up the power levels we're seeing him have versus the crazy amounts of people he's just taking out. You literally have Throg and Lockjaw beat him, and then he turns around unconsciously and beats three of them. Uh, whatever. But I just love Throg, so he gets a pass on this issue, honestly, because Throg didn't die. And I'm just glad that didn't happen. And that pretty much wraps up the comic book portion of the week. Um, I really, I really enjoyed this stuff and I will be talking about next week's comic books, things that I am excited to be looking forward to on Monday, episode 6A, and that is going to be Monday the 22nd. Moving on from actual comic books, I have several things here that have been in the news that are comic book media related that I would like to discuss, starting off with something that made me laugh. Zack Snyder claiming he's going to do a, quote, faithful retelling of the King Arthur legend. Woo, buddy! That's funny. All right, so here's the thing. Uh, there is a reason that they call it the King Arthur legend. Uh, Arthurian tales are made up of centuries of retold tales and stories that have changed through the ages. He's not a person necessarily as much as he is the culmination of many nameless tales and legends that eventually came to be connected to the same name, Arthur. There are many, many versions of his tales that exist. It's 
you know, you could, was it, is it going to be Lady in the Lake handing out swords? Is it going to be a sword in the stone? Is Merlin going to be a good guy or the bad guy? Is Lancelot going to be existing or is he not evolved? Or does he come in at the end? Are there going to be other knights of the round table? Is Guinevere going to cheat on Arthur? Is she going to leave with Lancelot? Is she going to get killed at the end? Etc. Etc. No two iterations of the same of this story for a good reason. It's impossible to have a faithful rendition of something that isn't like a firm actual factual story so it's a big joke that he said that um i myself am a big fan of arthurian tales i was pretty much raised on a good variety of them and i continue to like them in my adulthood um i usually like the different renditions that they make the you know the ones that are marketed as new takes or new visions or whatever nonsense they say about these things um, but Snyder claiming that this is going to be a faithful retelling is honestly a bad sign for me. It tells me that he's cocky and that he's probably, well, we knew that, he's probably very determined about the direction he wants to take this in, which, let's be honest, isn't necessarily the best when it comes to his action movies. I have no doubt that this is going to be a really intense action movie with not a lot of, um, good plot. <laughs> we'll say that. Um, the other bit of Zack Snyder that I wanted to talk about was, we were thinking about it this week, did Zack Snyder, um, uh, did he screw over Ava DuVernay in Tom King's New Gods movie? Um, I did a poll on Twitter this past week and it got two no votes and one yes vote, so I don't even know how to take that. <laughs> but... The thing is, New Gods movie was announced in 2018. It's going to be Ava DuVernay and Tom King working on a script that's, that is more or less surrounding Barda, Big Barda, and Scott Free. Um, and I haven't heard hide or hair about it since probably mid-2020. I know it was brought up sometime during the 2020 online convention interviews. Tom King was asked about it and he said that it is still in the works. Um, but Ava has put out so many projects and so much new stuff and so many announcements and hasn't made a peep about new gods in much longer than it's been since Tom King has. And Tom King himself, he has three ongoing issues right now. He has a series, excuse me. He has Batman, Catwoman, Rorschach, and there's a third one. Strange Adventures. <laughs> it's blinking real hard for a second there. He has three ongoing series right now. While he's probably not actively writing many of them, I imagine Batman Catwoman is completely finished. I think it actually has been for some time. It's just Clay Mann's fantastic, intricate art that we're waiting on. Um, all this stuff that they're doing, I don't really see how they have time for this New God script. You look on IMDb and it just says that it's been announced. Um, there is nobody else attached to it. There were rumors about Kathy Bates being Granny Goodness, but that's the thing. Zack Snyder has now put Granny Goodness in his Justice League. Um, I That, that kind of makes me think that we won't see her in a New Gods movie and she would have to be you know, a, a fairly integral character in it to for it all to work, especially if you're talking a, a movie more or less about Scott Free and Big Barda. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm wondering, what do people think about that? Do you think Zack Snyder's uh, Justice League... And uh, another reason uh, to add on to that, that possibly I think that his Justice League uh, re-release, director's cut, whatever we're calling this, is kind of messing it up, is how much money they have put into this crap. It's some something like seven million. I don't know. I, it's a lot of money. Um, <laughs> they put a lot of money into Zack Snyder um, doing reshoots and things on a film that he sold to fans as being in the can at Warner Brothers Studios. They just won't let him release it. Um, but that's a whole other conversation for another time. So hopefully we'll still get the New Gods movie, but the fact that we haven't had any talk or anything about it in such a long time doesn't strike me as a good sign. Something else, the last Zack Snyder comment I want to make. I forgot to talk about this last week. I cannot believe it. The biggest deal in the, in the Zack Snyder Justice League trailer that was actually the second trailer, the biggest deal I completely forgot to talk about. So the Joker says, <laughs> we live in a society. Now, if... You don't know what that means. The joke is meant as a cliche, uh, well, it's, it started as like, you know, deep teenagers who think they know what deep is, 
um, as a note from them on how things are always going to be unfair and unjust in a in a working society. And it quickly became a meme of people making fun of them, kind of along the lines of if you saw the video about the video game reviewers saying the whole thing about Miles Morales having the exaggerated swagger of a black teen, it became a meme in that sense very quickly. Um, and people used it on the Joker as a, a, a picture meme format, although he's never said that line. So... Zack Snyder having the Joker actually say, we live in a society in this trailer. It it followed up with something, but it was, he said, we live in a society. There was a long pause and then he followed up. Um, So this was on purpose, 100%. um, But was this him taking himself way too seriously or did he really just put an internet meme in his multi-billion dollar movie? (laughs) I'm not really sure. I hope that it's the second one because if he's taking himself that seriously that he thinks that having the Joker say that is deep and meaningful, this movie's gonna suck. I'm sorry, but it's gonna be bad. (laughs) Three other somewhat nerdy properties that have been announced in, or talked about really extensively in the news in the past week or so have been Emma Stone's Cruella, I should really say Disney's Cruella starring Emma Stone, the Aquaman King of Atlantis three episode show on HBO, and Mortal Kombat released its trailer. So starting from the top, uh, Emma Stone, Cruella, the main Disney's Cruella starring Emma Stone. The main takeaway I think most people are getting from that is that Disney really likes Harley Quinn and wanted to do their own take on her. Um, there's a lot of ways to take that. <laughs> it is very much meant to be. I think you're supposed to see that clearly as taking inspiration from Harley Quinn. I don't think they're trying to hide that. Um, I also think that they're going to be changing the narrative so that it's not Cruella skinning dogs. It's going to be something else, like someone else who's in her group or something else is happening and so that somehow people can get on board with her as a character because I don't think anyone is going to get on board with her if the movie ends with her skinning a hundred puppies to make this coat. Um, <laughs> or wanting to skin a hundred puppies to make this coat. I don't know. We'll see how it all plays out, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to be that. Um, the costume design is stunning. I'm not sure how believable the dress that catches on fire in the trailer is. It's very much Katniss Everdeen of a look (laughs) to throw in that reference of Hunger Games, which I didn't really like as a movie. But I'm interested to see how the costume design for this movie holds up compared to Cruella's costumes that Glenn Close wore in the 1996, I can't believe it was that long ago, 101 Dalmatians live action movie. I saw that movie countless times as a kid through my childhood. I absolutely loved it. Certain parts scared me, certain parts thrilled me, I laughed, I cried, you know, the whole thing. Um, I gotta watch it again before Cruella premieres, but I'm curious how this is gonna hold up to that, if it's gonna be kind of a similar Cruella Cruella character, or if they're gonna go with a definitely different sort of lean. The reaction is generally positive, it seems. The Harley thing is definitely seen as extremely bad or extremely genius and everything in between, so take that how you will. Um, think out your own opinions on things, as always. Some people really do loathe the look they're giving her. Um, I think they're possibly taking the crazy thing a little bit too hard, but at the same time, I possibly think they're trying to make a female version of the 2019 Joker movie. Now, by that, I don't mean I think that they're trying to create a movie of the same exact kind of characteristics in the person um, by any means like that. I think what I mean by that is something more along the lines of, I think they're trying to make a movie of an extreme personality type, um, but a woman this time that is seen as generally both in the movie society and in our society as like super problematic, like what you're, that's, that's not okay. You're a freak or whatever. Um, and then have them basically embrace that side of themselves and reject society telling them not to be like that. That's ultimately very, very loosely, but very, very broadly, I guess. Um, that's what the Joker movie was. And so I kind of think maybe they're trying to do that same thing with this Cruella movie. Maybe I'm looking too far into it, but, um, I'll watch it for sure. I don't know how much it's going to be, but I will definitely watch it. Um, let's see if it's going to be as successful as the Joker or as the Harley Quinn Birds of Prey movie. I don't think it will be as successful as either, but I'm still rooting for it because I think it's going to be a fun film. And the Aquaman King of Atlantis on HBO was announced a year ago. It is an animated kids series, but it seems to be one of those things that is more or less, uh, 
aimed at kids, but they're well aware that most of their audience is adults. <laughs> Um, I myself am not really sure if I'm going to watch this. It's one of those very extreme animation types, kind of like they have in the Teen Titans Go and such shows, which uh, a lot of the producers are involved with kids' shows like that. There's producers from Annabelle Comes Home, Swamp Thing, Teen Titans Go, Thundercats Roar, and Batman vs. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So it's definitely aimed towards kids but I think this is going to be a very adult audience, so we'll see how the marketing and such goes forward for that. And finally, in this film that is not DCU or... D or well, okay, yeah, not DCU or MCU stuff, Mortal Kombat trailer came out. Uh, I myself am not a big gamer, but this looks cool, and as many people across the internet are saying, um, this is like monster movies. I'm not going to this movie for a really solid plot. I'm going to this movie for some kick-ass action, and, like, cool characters who have cool powers and shit like that. I just want to have some fun. I, like I said, I'm not a gamer. I'm not super familiar with Mortal Kombat as the 1995 movie or even as the game or anything like that. But I think I'll definitely be watching this. I know my husband is super into it. He loved the 95 movie. And apparently the soundtrack to the 95 movie plays in the background of this trailer. So check that out if you are interested in Mortal Kombat. It comes out on April 16th. I believe it is going to be streaming, dot, dot, dot. Um, but that comes out April 16th, and I'm super excited for it. There was a lot of jokes around the internet. I guess somebody wrote this article trying to shame them for not putting Chun-Li in it. Chun-Li's in Street Fighter. I know that. <laughs> I don't play either of these games. Um, not to shame people, but <laughs> the article's still up, apparently. It comes out April 16th, Mortal Kombat. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. The characters look like they're fairly accurate to their design of pictures that I've seen. Again, I'm not a pro at this stuff. I just have general, very general knowledge of it. But I'm going to have a lot of fun watching this, I have no doubt. Um, and you'll actually recognize some of the actors and actresses in this, so check it out. It'll probably be a really fun movie for like the 50th time. Mortal Kombat comes out April 16th. Now it's time to touch on some MCU things. First of all, very shortly, um, yesterday, the 18th of February, the rights for Punisher and Jessica Jones had officially returned to Marvel. Now that is an exciting thing because we know that they had both their own Netflix TV shows, which were pretty good. I honestly never finished season two of Jessica Jones because I did not like what they were doing with Patsy Walker. What the fuck is Trish? Trish? Ugh. Um, sorry, I <laughs> had to get that out. Um, but fans are theorizing that because the rights have returned to Marvel, these two characters could pop up in the upcoming She-Hulk film. They, as far as I know, haven't... Film, I said film. TV show. Gosh, I gotta get this stuff right. Um, as far as I know, they haven't started any filming with that. But it's definitely the time period that they'll, they're going to be looking into people to bring on board as other actors to go with Tatiana Maslany. And I would be so stoked to see either of these characters in there. We already know that there were rumors that Charlie Cox's Daredevil from the Netflix Daredevil series might be appearing as Peter Parker's lawyer in Spider-Man 3. I would lose my shit, honestly, if that happened, because I have wanted that since I saw episode one of Daredevil and since we had a new Spider-Man. I don't honestly remember which one came first uh, in the timeline, but the, oh my gosh, could you imagine Charlie Cox's Daredevil or Charlie Cox's Matt Murdock across from Tom Holland's Peter Parker or even his Spider-Man? Oh god, they would look so good on screen. And Kingpin? Oh my gosh, could you imagine Tom Holland fighting this Kingpin? Oh my god, that would be amazing. He's he's such a great kingpin. I'm getting away from myself again. So that's really fun. Those rumors are, are popping around. I would love to see Punisher or Jessica Jones in pretty much anything officially MCU, and I would love for them to keep Kristen Ritter and what's his name who played Punisher, um, whose name I don't remember off the top of my head, as the actors for those, because I think they did a really good job. I honestly can't imagine another actress besides Kristen Ritter playing Jessica Jones, and the same for Punisher. Um, he is a phenomenal man, as well as, I know, for the most part, publicly, um, as well as actor. He did a great job with Punisher, but he also is really great at reminding people cops should not be putting Punisher logos on their cars. That's not what this shit means. Moving on, 
the other MCU news that we had this week was Danny Elfman confirmed he's working on a score for Doctor Strange, the Multiverse of Madness, which is, of course, Doctor Strange 2. That's really exciting. Danny Elfman is, of course, a composer. He is known for his somewhat eerie scores. He is working on this probably because of director Sam Raimi, who he worked together with on Spider-Man and Spider-Man 2. He also did Tim Burton's Batman as well as 15 other movies to make 16 total live-action Tim Burton movies, as well as uh, Men in Black, the Fifty Shades movies, and the animated musical Nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, I guess the themes of Desperate Housewives and The Simpsons as well. So those are two really big ones. The Simpsons obviously bigger. Um, this is really exciting for me. I have loved Danny Elfman's scores across the various Burton films for the most part that I've seen heard them on. Um, so I think this probably confirms that they're giving Sam Raimi the reins for Multiverse of Madness. He's not writing it, but he is directing it. And if he's brought on Elfman, it's likely that he's going to bring in other people he's worked with in the past, like certain Tobey Maguire's who may have worked on certain Spider films and certain Peter Parker characters. <laughs> um, so let's run down. Let's do the rundown for Multiverse of Madness. What we know so far, Sam Raimi is directing. He had done the previous Spider-Man trilogy. Danny Elfman's score, who had scored the first two of those movies, as well as many, many other excellent films. Confirmed cast so far is Elizabeth Olsen as Wanda Maximoff slash Scarlet Witch, Rachel McAdams as Dr. Christine Palmer, Benedict Cumberbatch as Dr. Stephen Strange. Oh boy. I haven't looked this one up, sorry. Chiwetel Ejiofor, I'm so sorry, as Mordo, <laughs> Benedict Wong as Wong, and Zochi Gomez, I looked that one up, as America Chavez. We also know that Mephisto is going to be making an appearance based on the fact that America is and the scene that was rumored to happen was America and Mephisto. So it's if she's going to be there, it's, it's pretty much known that he's going to be in it. And the rumors are also that various Spider-Men are going to be appearing because of Sam Raimi and Loki or the Ancient One might as well, too. We also know Willem Dafoe was offered a role. I'm not sure if he took it, but... I would theorize that he is going to be Nightmare. I've seen some pictures. He looks pretty much uncannily like the old school Nightmare back in the, gosh, 70s and 80s. So that's really exciting. Um, I would say more likely to see Loki in the series than probably most of these other people. Uh, Spider-Man, I guess. I definitely think we're going to see Mephisto. Um, since we're going to see America, I think it's going to be some crazy stuff. And I haven't watched WandaVision today. There's a new episode today. I'm really excited to watch it, but we'll find out hopefully by the end of the season if a fist is going to be in it. And then it might be in this, but this isn't coming out until 2022. So next year, gosh, it's 2021. So lots of, lots of exciting things happening on the Doctor Strange multiverse of madness front. I swear every announcement they make for this movie, I get more and more excited um, the casting rumors only add to that, so it's going to be really fun. Marvel also announced this week, well, somebody on Reddit, I guess, put up a release chart for all of Marvel's, um, all of Marvel's releases for the rest of the year, and what it came out to be is that there is going to be something new every single Friday for Marvel for the rest of 2021. That's pretty bonkers, and um, I'm excited for it. I'm, I'm fine with giving Disney my money. I like them. Um, <laughs> so this is really cool. You can go ahead and look that up online. I'm sure plenty of people have reposted it all over the internet. I've seen it in many places myself, so that's really cool. It includes um, movies, TVs, shows, and behind-the-scenes things that will be released also on these Friday weeks. So check that out. If you're already subscribed to Disney+, Plus, you're good to go, and if not, I can't recommend that enough. They have a plethora of stuff, and based on the Disney Investors Day show thing that they had several months ago, it's only gonna get so much more worth your money in this year and the coming years. Finally, and my last subject on this podcast this week, I want to talk about something that was announced just yesterday, and that is the Spawn Universe. Uh, this was announced by Todd McFarlane at the Comics Pro Retailer Summit. That Spawn is going to be 2021, Year of the Spawn is what he's calling it. And it is Spawn Universe. Basically, starting in August, retailers will be able to order Spawn Universe number one, which is going to be, a, I believe, a one-shot book 
setting the stage for this whole thing that'll split out into three different monthly titles. Now the team book, let's see, I gotta, I gotta make sure I'm getting this right. The team book is going to be titled The Scorched, and that is going to feature Spawn, Redeemer Spawn, Gunslinger Spawn, Medieval Spawn, and She Spawn, whose name is Jessica Priest. Um, then the, uh, the other two ongoing series will be Gunslinger Spawn and King Spawn, which are going to be coming out in, I believe, Gun- King Spawn starts in August and Gunslinger Spawn, I think, starts in October. So that's really exciting. I had initially thought, when I heard Todd McFarlane was creating a Spawn universe, I swear my first initial vision was Todd McFarlane at the top of this pyramid just handing down scripts to these writers that he knows and an artist and, th- and friends and things to write what he wants them to write. It's not that. Thank God it's not that. That probably would be a nightmare of a universe to have to read. But it's actually going to be... Now let me see if I can find the correct quote here. First he says, The character Spawn will now join the rare company of stalwart characters like Superman, Spider-Man, and Batman that will have multiple monthly books for the same title character. It will also mark the first time in 28 years that anyone can buy monthly issue number one Spawn book, which is what these, the number one issues for these new books. Um, there was a better quote that I found. Oh, this is a really good one. The simple question is, DC Comics started a shared universe in the late 1930s. Marvel Comics began theirs in the early 1960s, so can lightning strike a third time in beginning in 2021? He says he doesn't know the answer to that, but the only way to find out is to make an attempt. Um, and the third really good quote that I found was that is going to be covering... He It says, it says Todd states... The quest isn't to have our ideas exclusively live in the comic book industry, but to have merit and value outside the industry as well. Spawn has been an example of what can happen with one creation. So what are the possibilities if hundreds of creators are brought together? Marvel and DC Comics have shown us that a collective group of characters together, if shared for the universe, can resonate globally. Basically what he's saying here is he's going to bring in all of these characters and invite them to write their stories for these Spawn characters and they're going to be writing the stories. It's not going to be Todd McFarlane's Spawn. It's going to be Todd McFarlane's Spawn written by all of these other people. And that's where he's really pushing it in the getting the universe started, where this is going to be a lot of different brains coming in with a lot of different ideas to get it going really quickly, as opposed to him shelling out scripts to people to write the way he wants them to be written. When you have multiple creators with multiple points of view and multiple ideas, you're going to get a lot better stories. And he has a lot of people listed here. I have a very long list of names. It's going to be... And of course, I do have to say, unless I'm mistaken, there's not a single woman on this list, which is not surprising. Yeah, I'm just rereading it again right now. There's not a single woman on this list. Todd McFarlane notoriously does not like working with women. Do not forget that when you are supporting his stuff. He is not really a great guy when it comes to that stuff. But that doesn't mean that he can't write good stuff. The creators who have already signed on for this project are Art Adams, Sean Alex, uh, Jason Sean Alexander, Carlo Barberi, Brett Booth, J. Scott Campbell, Greg Capullo, Donnie Cates, Jim Chung, Mike Del Mundo, Javier Fernandez, David Finch, Jonathan Glapion, Kevin Keane, Elise Cote, Puppeteer Lee, Sean Lewis, Sean Gordon Murphy, Ben Oliver, Steven Segovia, Paul Sequira, Mark Silvestri, Marcio Takara, and Frank Quitely, as well as others, he says. Uh, that's really exciting. I will rejoice the day that there is a female name added to that list. I apologize if I have misgendered anyone. <laughs> um, but just to give you a rundown of things that have been happening recently in Spawn history, they released, well, Todd released a Spawn Kickstarter action figure, which set a new Kickstarter record for the action figure category raising just under three and a half million dollars in 30 days. That figure was somehow awarded the 2021 People's Choice Toy of the Year Award, even though no one in the U.S. has received theirs yet. This was supposed to arrive in, I think, it was like November or December or something. I think it was December of 2020, and it's February, and See, he waited until it was already supposed to be at people's front doors, until he came out and said, listen, there's been some delays. <laughs> that was not a good choice. But Spawn has been undoubtedly a massively successful indie project from Image. I am really interested in, of course, the She Spawn character. And after doing some very brief research, it turns out I have her first appearance. So I'm covered there. It is Spawn 302, if you want to know. She has some cameos and some first appearances as just Jessica Priest. 
If you're interested in those, they're separate from much longer ago, but it was only recently last year in issue 302 that she appeared fully for the first time as Jessica Priest, She Spawn. I'm not sure what it is about the name Jessica and red hair that people love about comic women, but it happens to be all the time everywhere. And that just about wraps up this week's Sensational She Geek live from Yancey Street podcast. Thank you once again for tuning in if you've made it this far. Thank you very, very much for listening again. Go ahead and give me some feedback if you have anything to say, if you have any comments or questions about things that we've talked about. And otherwise, I will be back Monday, February 22nd for the second to last February episode. Remember, it's a short month. It's only 28 days this year. I'll be back Monday the 22nd to talk about this week's WandaVision episode. It is premiering today. I have not watched it yet. I wait for my husband to come home from work because I'm a nice person. (laughs) Um, And I'll be talking about that in depth as it appears to be a very exciting episode on Monday the 22nd episode. And I will also be talking about things that I am looking forward to come out in the following comics week, or I guess in that comics week coming out the 23rd and the 24th. There is a lot to look forward to. I can already tell you that. And anything else that happens between now and then, news-wise, culture-wise, I know that Hasbro is doing some toy announcements today that have been super disappointing for people, so maybe I'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit more extensively on Monday as well. And once again, my name is Anna. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you would like to find me online, You can find my website where I write some reviews. I have character reading lists for a lot of my favorite female characters, including commentary on what is actually happening in the issues for some of them. It's a lot. It's a big work in progress, but it's it's all there. The roots of it are all there on the site. Um, I also have uh, some random little reviews and commentary on things that happen in the comics and the comics world. You can check all that out at www.sensationalshegeek.weebly.com. If you've ever wondered what the sensational and my sensational she geek thing is, it's, it's because Sensational She-Hulk is a very famous comic book starring one of my favorite characters, She-Hulk. And it's just a play on words. You can find me on Twitter at Savage She Geek because Sensational was too many letters and Savage She Hulk was her first series. Um, and you can find me on Instagram at Anna with the comics because my name is Anna. Nice to meet you. This podcast is hosted off of Podbean, but it also gets posted onto YouTube as well as Apple Podcasts. So whichever format works best for you. I think it's going to get posted off Spotify soon too. So keep an eye out for it there if you like to do that. And thank you again for tuning in to this week's episode. Episode 6A will be on Monday the 22nd. And I hope to hear from you then or see from you then or whatever this is. Have a nice weekend and remember always stay sweaty.